my dear friends, I'm delighted to announce to you the arrival of Chilling 2.0. There are tons of new features and a fresh new look. What's more, Chilling is now free. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, it is now free. There's new content, including full-length novels, podcasts, and much more. And there are plenty of new features, including creator profiles, and you have the ability to follow your favorite narrators, including yours truly, as well as authors, and even be notified when they post new content, community discussions, and much, much more. More video content is coming this summer, and did I mention it's free? That's right. Start listening free today. It's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink. And listen. Beyond the Grave by Joseph Rubas Evan Kurtz stood facing the front doors of Tannersville High on the morning of August 31st, his stomach rolling and his head aching. Kids with backpacks streamed around him, talking and playing on their phones, and the principal, a fat man with a bad comb-over, stood by the entrance of one of the teachers, an older woman in a denim dress. He nodded curtly to the students like he didn't want to greet them, but felt he had to. If it hadn't been for their presence, Evan would have turned and walked away. He couldn't do it. Not without Eugene. Looking around, hoping faintly for some salvation, Evan found nothing. Only faces of kids he barely knew. Kids who existed outside his realm. Kids he had never particularly liked. To him, they'd never mattered. He had Eugene, his twin, and that was enough. Him and Eugene against the world. But now Eugene was dead and he was so alone that he might as well have been on the moon, looking down at Earth a million miles away. Taking a deep breath, Evan hooked his thumbs under the straps of his backpack and started walking, keeping his head low. At the door, feeling the principal's gaze on him, he slipped through the door and into the lobby. Halls branched off on three sides of him. A blue banner with yellow writing hung over one of the passageways. Welcome back, it said, its light, airy tone mocking him. Your brother's dead. Welcome back. You're alone in the world. Welcome back. The din of talking and laughter was overwhelming. Happy, smiling faces floated all around him, dancing like pagans around a fire. They didn't have a care in the world. Fuckers. Their lives weren't ruined. They hadn't lost the only person who understood them, their only constant in a life of change. All they had to worry about was whether they could find a girlfriend and pass remedial English. Morons. Idiots. He and Eugene were better than them. They were better than all the kids they'd ever gone to school with. He knew it. Eugene knew it. Even the other kids knew it. That's why none of them ever liked them. He and Eugene existed on a higher plane. Evan was the artist, the historian, abstract and artistic. Eugene was the mathematician, cool, calculated. Together, they were a perfect whole. Now they were fractured, separated by death. Closing his eyes, Evan sent his brother a message. Can you hear me? Someone brushed by him while he waited for a response. A black kid in a light blue shirt and a pair of jeans. Evan could have hit him. When it was clear that Eugene wasn't going to reply, Evan sighed and started toward the cafeteria, tears threatening to well up in his eyes. In life, he and Eugene had shared a special bond. Not one simply of brotherhood, but also of the mind. When they were alone, they rarely opened their mouths to speak. When one was here and the other there, they traded messages without the aid of cell phones. Telepathy, Eugene called it. Evan called it twinning. Eugene said that many twins had a telepathic connection. I don't know why, he said once, a book opened before him. There's no logical reason for it. He went on to cite a dozen studies conducted in the 1950s and 60s. Most of what he said sailed right over Evan's head. Now, he wished he'd listened. 
When Eugene died over the summer, the sudden and aggressive cancer appearing and killing him in less than a month, Evan was numb, shocked. He simply couldn't believe it. When the loss hit him, he was inconsolable for a month, and in that time he dreamed of his brother, and when he'd wake, he'd be sure, sure, that they could still communicate that his mental transmissions could penetrate the very veil of death itself. Try as he may, however, they never had. In the cafeteria, kids lined up by the counter. Dozens more occupied tables arranged in the middle of the room. Evan wasn't hungry, so he went straight to the first empty table he saw and sat down, dropping his backpack next to him. Eugene, I need you. Nothing. Hey, asshole. Evan, hitherto looking at his hands, glanced up. A tall blonde boy in a leather jacket stood on the other side of the table, a tray in his hands. Two other boys flanked him, one with red hair and one with black. The latter looked like a rodent. The former was fat. This is our table, the blonde boy said. I was here first, Evan murmured. Too bad. Move. He sat his tray down and his lackeys did likewise. Anger rising inside him, Evan opened his mouth to protest, but stopped. Leave him, a voice said in his mind. Eugene's voice. Eugene? Leave him. Get out of there. Just bursting with excitement, Evan grabbed his backpack, got up, and hurried across the cafeteria to the main doors. In the closest bathroom, he selected the biggest stall, locked the door, and sat on the commode. Eugene? Are you there? No reply. Eugene? Nothing. Lisa Anderson glanced out of the window over the sink just as Jim pulled down the sapling that had been growing by the fence. Wielding a machete, he chopped its supple body until the majority of it came off in his hands. Looking down, she realized she'd been scrubbing the same plate for several minutes and rinsed it off, putting it in the drying rack. All that remained were a few forks and the metal bowl she'd mixed the pancake batter in. Not much. Suddenly she was very tired and wanted to go lie on the couch. She thought back to the dream she'd had of Eugene and shuddered. She didn't know what time it woke her, She'd been up ever since, for five hours, maybe more. She tried to tell Jim about it, but he brushed her off, saying he had things to do. She'd started to get angry with him, but stopped herself. He was grieving just as much as she was. Eugene's loss had hit Jim Anderson like a semi-truck. Though they'd only had custody of the boys for eight months, he'd already come to think of them as their sons. When Eugene began to waste away in June... Jim, too, began to fade, emotionally rather than physically. Before the end, he was a wreck. Lisa herself wasn't much better. Many times she cried herself to sleep at night, so worried about her son that her stomach clenched and gurgled. At first, the doctors gave them hope, but the chemo didn't work, and right before Eugene died, Dr. Weston told them point blank, he's not going to make it. They didn't give up hope, though, Till the bitter end they held out, praying for a miracle. It never came. Eugene Kurtz died on July 28th at the age of 14. Presently, Lisa sighed, absent-mindedly chewing her bottom lip. Eugene's death was hard on all of them, but Evan bore the worst of it. When they were three, the state took them away from their mother, crackhead whore that she was, and placed them in foster care. In the ten years before Lisa and Jim had adopted them, they'd been through six foster homes, two orphanages, a group home, and a residential treatment facility, where kids, unwanted and uncontrollable, were watched over by staff members 24-7. Eugene once told her that, on average, they were in one place for less than six months before moving on. That's horrible, Lisa said. You never got to put roots down. Eugene smiled in that knowing way that he had, the one that melted her heart the first time she'd met him. That's all right. I have Evan. 
Now that bond was broken. Evan was alone. Lisa blinked back tears. Oh, it wasn't fair. Evan had already been so much in his short life. Now this. Why? Why was life so goddamn cruel? Turning off the faucet, Lisa dried her hands on a dish towel and made her way into the living room. Sunlight cascaded through the big picture window overlooking the front yard. Too bright. Too happy. She closed the curtains and sat down on the couch. On TV, Ginger Z talked to a celebrity chef about healthy eating. <laughs> healthy eating? What did healthy eating matter when cancer could take you out of the blue? Or did anything matter? <gasps> Don't think like that. Lisa took a deep breath and exhaled through her nostrils. She was wrong to think that way. That sort of thinking led to self-pity. And self-pity was the worst thing anyone could experience. Eugene wouldn't want her to feel that way. She still had Evan to think about. She was just getting herself under control when the back door opened and Jim came in. He shut the door, kicked out of his shoes and came into the living room, a sheen of sweat on his forehead. Yeah, what are you watching? He asked lightly. Good morning, America, she said, fighting to keep her voice steady. She was okay. Okay. Well, I'm not really watching it, though. Ah, uh, I have to go to Aces. We're out of weed color. Even the house, Lisa thought, the idea draining her. Suddenly, she wanted to spite the exhaustion inside of her. I'll come with, she said, getting up. We need some things at the store. Well, they didn't. Not really. And Jim nodded. All right. Ten minutes later, they were following Route 10 south, Jim behind the wheel. Before entering Tannersville and turning into Main Street, it twists and turns through the hills, and for a stretch matches the Pine River bend for bend. Lisa watched out of the window as the countryside passed. The radio was on, classic rock. I hope Evan's doing all right, she said. He's probably fine, Jim replied. He likes school. That's when he had Eugene. As soon as the words passed her lips, she wished she hadn't spoken them. The name hung heavy in the air between them, like a gathering thunderstorm. Eugene. He'll uh, adjust, Jim said. His voice sounded hollow and dead. Kids always adjust. Lisa wondered. Three that afternoon, Evan Kurtz unlocked his bike from the metal stand by the flagpole and walked it to the pavement. School had been out for close to half an hour, and most of the other kids had gone home. Only a few stragglers were left. Evan was just about to climb onto the bike when someone grabbed him and swung him around. The blonde boy, his eyes dancing with malicious glee, smiled through bad teeth. His cronies, Fat Boy and Rat Boy, were there too. Hey, ass breath, Blondie said. Going somewhere? Evan tried to pull away. Let go. Yeah? Blondie shoved him then. He went down on top of his bike, the handlebar catching him in the stomach and knocking the air out of him. You killed him, Jet? Rat Boy laughed. Evan pushed himself up, his stomach aching. You're going to watch yourself, faggot, Jet was saying, poking his finger in Evan's direction. Never sit at my table again. Jet lashed out, kicking the bike's rear tire. Then he was gone, his cronies on either side of him. Sitting in a broken pile, Evan could hear them for a long time before their voices faded away. Rat Boy was Bob, and Fat Ass was Tyler. Getting to his feet, Evan righted his bike and checked the tire. It wasn't dented. He climbed on and started pedaling, hanging a right at School Street and flying south toward Maine. In the distance, Mount Ridgeway rose into the hazy blue sky. From School Street, he turned left onto Park Place, a residential lane lined with small ranch houses and shady trees. As he biked, he thought of Jet and the other two, and hot anger gripped his stomach. Why were they messing with him? He didn't know it was their table. 
Gritting his teeth, he turned onto High Street, which climbs Lookout Hill, and turned onto the no-name gravel road running below the cemetery. Heaven's Gate, which occupies Heaven's Hill, had been in use since 1885 and contained most of Tannerville's dead. The hill was too steep to ride, so he jumped off and pushed his bike the rest of the way. At the gate, he sat it down and went inside, moving among the rough headstones. As he passed, he glanced at some of them. Mary Parker, 1887-1902. Reginald Peep, June 5th, 1868, November 16th, 1920. Eugene's grave commanded a sweeping view of the valley, and the town clustered along the river to the farmland stretching away in the south. Eugene Kurtz, March 10th, 2003, June 28th. 2017. Every time Evan saw his brother's headstone, something like anguish went through him. Today, however, it was tinged with hope. Kneeling, breathing heavy from the walk up the hill, he crossed himself like Lisa had taught him. It's me, Evan, he said out loud. He waited for a moment before going on. I know you can hear me. Why don't you say something? I... Evan's heart leapt into his throat. Eugene? Evan? I'm so glad you're here. I miss you. I miss you too. The grave is cold. Evan was taken aback. Cold? Yes. And dark. You aren't in heaven? There is no heaven. The gravity of what his brother was saying struck him then, and horror filtered through his veins. Where are you? My coffin. Evan licked his lips. It's not so bad, though. I sleep most of the time. Uh, Can I help? No. You need to worry about yourself. Why with Jim and Lisa getting ready to give you up and all? Eugene's words stabbed Evan. Give me up. Eugene didn't respond. Give me up. They're going to send you back to the group home. You're just a burden. Like me. It's my fault. Me getting sick and dying on them was a lot to take. Evan tried to process what his brother was telling him. Jim? Lisa? Give him up? But they loved him, just like they loved Eugene. Right. That was before, though. Since I died, haven't they changed? Evan thought. Yeah, actually, they had. And they weren't themselves. Sometimes at night they fought. He could hear them through the walls. Not their words, but the tones of their voices. Jim seemed kind of... dull, while Lisa spent most of her time being listless. Sometimes, he knew, she cried. Maybe they loved us before, but now we're just a burden. You know how much my funeral cost. Evan blinked. A funeral? Uh, no. Eight thousand dollars figure boggled Evans' mind. They took it out of their retirement savings. That's when they started wanting to give you up. Too much work. Too much money. Panic began welling up in him. How could they give up on him like that? How could they send him back to the group home? Suddenly his panic turned to rage. They told him they loved him. They said they thought of him and Eugene as their own kids. But they lied. He was stupid to think they actually cared about him. Why would they love him when his own mother hadn't even loved him? Forget them. They could go to hell. I'm the only one who loves you, Eugene said. And that was the truth.
Miss Anderson went to the window and glanced out into the gathering gloom. A truck blew by on the road, followed by a silver minivan. Where is he? In the living room, Jim sat sprawled on the couch, the remote in his hand. Lester Holt was touring an inner city neighborhood on the evening news, wearing a serious expression that didn't strike Lisa as genuine. He probably stopped off to see his brother, Jim said without looking up. He should have been home hours ago, Lisa said. She went into the kitchen, stirred the chili, and went back to her vigil at the window. Evan got out of school at 2.45. Riding his bike, it should have taken him 45 minutes to get home. An hour if he stopped to see Eugene. He should have been home by 4.30 at the latest. It was now past 6.30. Visions of him lying on the side of the road, dead, struck by a hit-and-run driver, danced tauntingly through her head. He could have been kidnapped by a pedophile, but she didn't think that as lightly as being hit by a car. Route 10 was busy. God, if something happened to him. Just then, Evan turned into the driveway, and relief washed over her. Thank God, she muttered, and went to the door. Is he here? Jim asked. Without answering, she went out onto the porch just as Evan reached the bottom step. Where were you? Lisa asked. I was worried sick. Evan didn't reply. Instead, he chained his bike to the newel post and started up the stairs. His face, Lisa noticed, was red and his eyes were puffy as though he'd been crying. Lisa's stomach turned. God, what happened? She reached out, touched his shoulder. Honey, are you... I'm fine, he shouted, wrenching violently away. He disappeared into the house and pounded up the stairs. Jim appeared from the living room, looking from her to the steps, baffled. What was that about? I, I don't know, Lisa said, suddenly feeling very lost. I just asked him where he was. Evan had never snapped at her like that, even at his worst. That he did scared her. Something must have happened to him. A fight at school or... Or... Jim was hugging her then, and she let herself go limp in his arms. He's got a lot on his mind, he said, stroking her hair. I think Eugene's death is finally sinking in. She pulled away from him. Finally sinking in? Jim nodded. It's only been two months, Lisa. Barely. Sometimes it takes that long to process it all. Sometimes it takes even longer. When my grandmother died, I was in shock for a month and a half before it hit me. When he was seven, Jim's mother and father had died in a car crash, and he went to live with his grandparents in Indiana. His grandmother died when he was 17. To him, she was his mother, and her loss hit him hard. Lisa never knew her family having grown up in a foster home. She was close to her foster father, however, and when he died last winter, she cried. But it didn't take her two months to come to terms with it. You weren't 14, she admonished herself and felt stupid. Jim was right. I'm just worried, she said. Don't, Jim replied and kissed her forehead. He'll get over it in his own time. Later, at dinner, Evan was quiet and went out of his way, Lisa thought, to avoid making eye contact with them. Several times, Lisa started to say something, to ask him how his day was, but stopped herself. Just leave him be. After barely eating, the boy asked to be excused. Sure, Jim said. Looking down at his hands, Evan got up, dumped his bowl in the trash, and sat it in the sink. Upstairs... In the heavy purple twilight, he undressed and slipped into a pair of basketball shorts and a white t-shirt. After Eugene died, the Andersons moved him out of the big room he'd shared with his brother and into a smaller one under the eaves. First, he was thankful not to have to be in the same room with his brother's memory. But now he wondered. Did they have ulterior motives? Did they move him to help him cope or did they move him because they wanted the room for something else? Turning the light off, Evan climbed into bed and pulled the blankets over his head. 
Cocooned in warmth, he folded his hands on top of his chest and closed his eyes. The fact that he was lying like Eugene in his coffin wasn't entirely lost on him. I'm here. I know. Did she yell at you for being late? She started to. He thought back to Lisa Anderson on the porch, starting in on him before he'd even had a chance to put his bike away. What did she care? I was worried sick. No, she wasn't. She was worried, Eugene said. Worried she'd have to pay for another funeral. For a long time, Evan let those eight words float through his mind. Is that all he was to them? Dollar signs? When Eugene stopped responding, Evan put on the radio and listened to distant sounds. He'd always been partial to oldies, and sometimes Lisa joked that he had an old soul. Eugene helpfully pointed out that, given the hardships of their lives, he probably liked oldies because, subconsciously, he pined for a better time. A time when he wasn't alive. The Stampeders were singing Sweet City Woman now, and Evan thought back to the group home. He wasn't allowed to have a radio in the group home, and the other boys picked on him. The staff didn't care about him and nothing good ever happened. He told Jim and Lisa about it. They were sending him back. He balled his fists. On Friday morning, Evan Kurtz skipped breakfast and spent the last 15 minutes before the first bell rang sitting in a bathroom stall and talking to Eugene. I don't know why they're picking on me. Because they're sadists, that's why. It started the moment he locked his bike up. Jet came out of the bushes and pushed him down. Other kids passing by laughed. Then in the lobby, Bob yanked his pants down, giving everyone in the whole school a look at his underwear. Oh, how they laughed then. <laughs> Boxer shot. Well, I did sit at their table yesterday. That's not their table. Do they pay rent? No. No. And it isn't theirs. I just wish they'd leave me alone. They won't. They think they can pick on you and get away with it. And they'll keep doing it. You can tell as many teachers as you want, but they won't do anything. What can I do then? Eugene only laughed. When the bell rang, Evan went to his first period class, Earth Science. He noticed a few kids snickering and looking at him as he walked in. As he made his way to his desk, someone reached out and yanked at his jeans. He spun around. A boy with dull orange hair grinned up at him. Stop, Evan said. Stop, someone said in a mocking whine. Evan turned. Everyone was staring at him. Flushing, he took his seat while the teacher, Miss Johnson, called for order. All during the class, he kept trying to contact Eugene, but Eugene wouldn't answer. The bell rang at 8.50. In the hall, his books in hand, Evan started for his next class. Someone stuck out a foot and he went down hard. Everyone laughed cruelly. Evan's anger boiled over. Stop it, he shrieked his voice breaking. The laughter intensified. Getting to his feet, Evan ran. He didn't know where he was going until he found himself walking along High Street, the cemetery rising before him. He had no memory of leaving the school, no memory of the route until then. At Eugene's headstone, Evan sank to the ground. The whole school's picking on me now. That was quick. It's only the second day. I know. Bob pulled my pants down and everyone thinks it's open season. You have to make them stop. But how? With your mind. Evan was quiet. My mind? Yeah. Telekinesis. You know. Making things move by just looking at them. But I don't have telekinesis. Yes, you do. You just don't know it. 
Evan opened his mouth to argue, but stopped. Do I? Yes. You see that vase over there? Evan looked. A dark glass vase sat on a nearby tombstone. Yeah, that one. Move it. How? Look at it. Concentrate. Imaginate moving. This is stupid. Do it. Sighing, Evan focused his attention on the vase, furrowing his brow, straining. His body shook with the effort. At first, nothing happened. Then, something snapped in his brain. He started feeling tingly like phantom fingers were caressing it through his skull. On its perch, the vase tipped over. Evan jerked back. See? It was just the wind he said, though there was no wind. No, make it float. Again, Evan focused his attention on the vase. Again, his brain tingled, and again, the vase moved, this time rising jerkily into the air and hovering about a foot off the ground. Evan was gobsmacked. You have the power to make him stop. Use it. Lisa Anderson wasn't surprised when Evan came through the front door at 1.30. The school had called. There was an incident in the hall and Evan ran off in tears. What do you mean he ran off? She screamed into the phone. She wanted to go looking for him, but when she texted Jim at work, he called her and told her to back off. Give him some space. Last thing he needs is someone smothering him. Now she fought the urge to run to him and plant kisses on his forehead. Instead, she went to the threshold between the kitchen and the living room. He was kicking his shoes off. When he looked up, his eyes were puffy. Why are kids so goddamn mean? Hi, she said, doing her best to sound cheery. I figured I'd see you. Did the school call? She nodded. Yeah, they did. Evan looked away. What happened? I don't want to talk about it, he mumbled. Are you sure? I mean, I... uh, I don't want to talk about it. With that, he took off up the stairs, his feet pounding on the treads. Lisa winced as he slammed his door. Sitting on the couch in a bar of sunshine, she resisted the temptation to go after him. Jim was right. He needed space. His twin was recently dead, and on top of that, apparently the whole school was picking on him. The second day. When her anger passed, she called the school and demanded that something be done. The principal, Mr. Hoxetter, was very apologetic. We take cases of bullying very seriously at Tannersville High, Mrs. Anderson. I assure you no further incidents will take place. After she hung up, she tried to believe that that was true, that nothing else would happen to Evan. She had the feeling that she was wrong. Upstairs, under his covers, Evan talked to Eugene. Make them pay, Eugene said. Make them all pay. I can't hurt them. I I can't. And they'll hurt you. Simple as that. When Eugene stopped talking to him, he got out from under the blankets and sat on the edge of the bed, Looking at the window, he wondered if he could lift it with his mind. Focusing all of his energy, his anger, his grief, his hate, Evan imagined the window slamming up. And it did, startling him. But he had powers. He really had powers. He looked at his desk against the wall. His laptop opened and turned on. His lamp switched on. Oh, oh. Practice, Eugene said. Practice. Jim came home from work at 5.30. Lisa was just taking the chicken out of the oven when he came into the kitchen. Mm, Something smells good, he said. It's almost done, she replied, sitting it on top of the stove. Going into the fridge for a soda, Jim asked. So, uh, how's Evan? 
He's upset, Lisa said, opening the oven door and putting the chicken back in. She turned to face him. When he came home, I asked him if he wanted to talk about what had happened. He yelled that he didn't and went up to his room. He hasn't been down since. Jim sighed. That's to be expected, I guess. I feel so helpless, she said. It's bad enough he's dealing with Eugene Dine. Now the kids are picking on him. Jim sighed. I know. He was quiet for a moment, as if trying to come up with something more to say, and then repeated, I know. He looked at her. Did you talk to the school? Yeah, they said it wouldn't happen again. Well, let's hope they mean it. Oh, I don't know. How can you really prevent kids from picking on each other? <sighs> you can't, Jim said. How about I go talk to him? See how he's doing. Well, you can try. At Evan's door, Jim knocked. When the boy didn't reply, he tried the handle. It was open. Inside, shadows pooled deep. Evan was lying on top of his covers, his hands laced behind his head. On the radio, the beetle sang, Don't Let Me Down. Reluctant to fully enter the boy's space without first being invited, Jim stayed where he was. Hey, buddy. How's it going? Without turning his head, Evan said, Fine. Can I come in? If you want. Jim came in and sat down on the bed. Your mother told me what happened at school today. Some kids were messing with you. Evan shrugged. Yeah. Jim stayed for a while longer, but Evan didn't listen to what he was saying. When he was gone again, the boy slipped under the covers and called Eugene. I really thought they loved us. I'm the only one who loves you. You and me against the world, Evan said in the gloom, the sound of his voice miserable. Yes. Look, uh, don't let on that you know. They might do it sooner. Can I stop it? What if I clean the whole house and cut the grass and do everything? It's too late for that. They're going to give you up no matter what. Eugene stopped replying then, and Evan was left alone with his growing horror. There had to be something he could do. It was surely worth more to them as a live-in housekeeper than nothing. Maybe if he sat them down and talked to them. But Eugene said not to tell them. If they knew, he knew what they were planning, and they would ditch him quicker. I could run away. That thought came from the ether. Yeah, he could run away, live in the hills surrounding Tannersville. He'd be close to Eugene and he'd be on his own, no longer at the mercy of foster parents who didn't love him. He didn't know how to hunt, but he had his powers. If he wanted a rabbit, he could just make it come to him. If he needed a shelter, he could build one without lifting a finger. You can do just about anything. Eugene said earlier. The only limit is your imagination. Being the artist of the family, he had a great imagination. If he could really do anything he wanted with his power, he could do anything at all. Tomorrow he would go into the hills behind the house. He would test his powers, and if they really could get food with it and make a place to live, he'd run away. Could I do that? He asked Eugene. Maybe, Eugene replied sleepily. They'd find you eventually and make you go back to the group home. What if I went somewhere they didn't expect? Away? From me? If I have to. Oh, I'll be lonely. Well, I can come back and visit. Eugene didn't reply. Two doors down, Lisa sat up in bed pretending to read by lamplight. Next to her, Jim played a game on his smartphone. Something with zombies. I just don't want him slipping away from us, she said. I couldn't stand it. Well, neither could I, Jim said, putting the phone on his nightstand. I love him too, you know. I know. Maybe we can do something together tomorrow. Go out to eat. Go to Six Flags. Something. She sighed. 
the thought of spending time with Jim and Evan, her family, made her warm, but she knew that below that warmth was coldness, uncertainty. Eugene would still be gone. Evan would still be troubled. The kids at school would still make fun of him. Going off and having fun for a few hours wouldn't change anything. She said as much to Jim. Maybe not, but it'd be good to get our minds off of it for a little while. Saturday morning, Evan appeared bright and early. When he entered the room, Lisa felt a palatable tension. The mood of the morning going instantly dark. She smiled and said good morning. He forced a smile and returned her greeting. He looked so miserable and her heart broke into a million pieces. Over a breakfast of eggs, bacon and pancakes, she and Jim both attempted to get him to open up, but he resisted, picking at his food and looking away from them. When he was done, he asked to go outside. A half hour later, he left, and the house was silent. I'm really worried, she said. He's not like himself at all, and it happened so quickly. Jim didn't reply. Outside, Evan crossed the backyard to the trees rising up along the edge of the Anderson property. From there, he followed a narrow path winding through the dense underbrush. Warm September sunshine cascaded through the treetops, falling like sheets of fire, and birds sang jubilant songs to one another, the sweet melodic chorus soothing his fraying nerves. Evan had always enjoyed the peace and tranquility of nature, the birds chirping in the trees, the breeze slipping through the boughs, the clug, clug, clug of a stream bubbling over a rocky riverbed. Outside, he felt free, unrestrained, alone, and unafraid. Two miles from his back door, Evan came to the first hill, its floor carpeted with dead leaves. A mile further on, he came to a clearing overlooking the I-72, a winding ribbon of concrete wedged between sloping mountains in the lower forest. In the hazy distance, he could just make out the farthest reaches of Wilborn, the fourth biggest city in the state. Once Jim had brought them up here and pointed it out, saying that it was over ten miles away. Evan sat down and closed his eyes. Are you there? Yes. Did you hear them talking about you last night? Evan had, or rather he dreamed that he had. He dreamed that he put his ear against the Andersons' bedroom door and heard them plotting to send him back to the group home. It wasn't a dream, Eugene said. You were awake. Evan had suspected as much. So it's come to this. Yes. Evan closed his eyes and saw a vision of a rabbit sniffing a fallen tree. The image was so crisp and vibrant that it might as well have been real. It is. Call it to you. Rabbit? The rabbit, its nose twitching, looked up. Come here. He disappeared from the frame, and when Evan opened his eyes, he sat before him on its haunches, his head cocked quizzically. It worked. Of course it did. You can do anything. That night, Evan woke from the dream in which Jim and Lisa laughed as a child service worker dragged him through the front door, back to the group home. Their eyes were black and their mouths red. Shaking, he called out to Eugene. Mm, you're starting to pick up their thoughts. For the rest of the night, he sat up in bed with the light on, shifting sadness to anger and back again. Why were they doing this to him? Why were they sending him back? Why did they lie and say they loved him? Well, he wanted to hurt them, to make them pay for hurting him. Do it, Eugene urged. When the first light of day streamed through his window, he decided that he would make them pay. Some way, somehow. At breakfast, he forced himself to eat and make small talk with the Andersons. When he was done, he left and went to the hill. Walking through the woods, he talked to Eugene, asked him what he should do. Make them pay. Make them all pay. How? You know. What, like, kill them? Maybe. The thought scared him at first, but as the day wore on and grew warmer, he began to like it. He could kill them, 
And then they'd really pay. Jet, Bob, Tyler, Jim, Lisa. They all deserved it. Evan didn't return home until dusk. Though Lisa didn't yell at him, he saw the look in her eyes and almost struck out at her. At dinner, he surreptitiously watched them. Several times they looked at each other, and he saw what they were thinking. They were going to send him back soon. Maybe even by the end of the week. I hate them, Evan told Eugene later. I'm sick of people treating me this way. Tomorrow, Eugene said, and Evan smiled. Yes, tomorrow. Evan woke from a fitful sleep just as dawn crested in the east. He showered, dressed, and listened to the radio until it was time to leave. In the kitchen, Lisa was making Jim bacon and eggs. You riding your bike today? She asked. Yeah, he replied tightly. With that, he turned and walked out. Have a good day, Jim called after him. I love you, Lisa added. Evan slammed the door. He was still in a bad mood. From the Anderson house, Evan biked south into Tannersville. The town was just beginning to stir when he sailed through it. Make them pay. Make them all pay. At the school, Evan climbed off his bike and let it fall to the ground. It didn't matter if it got dented anymore. Nothing mattered. Pushing past a bunch of idiot kids, Evan entered the lobby and walked to the cafeteria. Standing in the entrance, he could see Jet and his buddies sitting at their table, laughing. Other kids clustered at other tables, all happy and without a care in the world. Kill them, Eugene said. Kill them all. Shaking with rage, his teeth grinding, Evan concentrated all of his energy on Jet. The tingling was stronger this time, more persistent. Jet, laughing, suddenly stopped and a strange look crossed his face. Scramble his brain. Brain. Skull fragments. Blood. Dark red liquid began to trickle from his nose and eyes. Bob stared. Tyler gasped. Jet wiped his nose, looked at his hand, and nearly screamed. He stood up, nearly fell, and wiped as more blood gushed from his nose. Evan blinked, and Jet's head exploded. Blood, bits of brain, and skull chips splattering his friends. The wall, the table. He had started screaming. Bob, getting to his feet, was next. Evan imagined his eyes falling out, and they did, plopping wetly onto the table. Tyler, looking horrified, fell on his ass and scrambled to his feet. Evan's eyes bored into him. Fire. Tyler's hair went up. Screaming, yelling, and crying filled the cafeteria. Bob, wailing and holding his hands to his face, stumbled back and fell against the wall. Blood gushed between his fingers. Evan jerked his head, and the bully's lower jaw came off. Tyler, rolling on the floor in a futile effort to stop the flames, writhed and shrieked. Kids were pushing past him now, screaming and tossing glances over their shoulders. Evan glanced at several, and they fell down dead. Their hearts stopped. A few teachers and a lunch lady had rushed into the cafeteria to try and douse the flames consuming Tyler. Evan blinked, and one of them, Mr. Jerry, who taught math, screamed. A red patch darkened his pants and when he staggered back, his testicles slipped from the cuff of his pants and lay on the floor. The lunch lady saw this and screamed. Evan sent a tray flying through the air, and it hit her in the head, and she fell. Do it, Eugene urged. Kill them all. Show them. Make them pay. Evan closed his eyes and thought of Jim Anderson, the man who pretended to love him, pretended to be his father. He saw him sitting at his desk, hunched over a stack of papers. Suddenly, his head wrenched back as if pulled by an invisible foe. One by one, his ribs popped from his chest, sticking out like bony white fingers from a grave. He wailed, and for a moment, Evan was horrified. 
He doesn't love you, Eugene said. Only I do. Resolved, Evan imagined Jim Anderson's throat ripping open. And it did, in a spurt of blood. Next, he thought of Lisa, the liar, the fake, covering him in kisses she didn't mean. She was at the sink washing a plate. It shattered, slicing her fingers. She screamed, fell a step back, and looked at her bloody hands. Bitch. Poor fraud. Her shirt ripped away from her body. Her back was bare. Evan could see her spine. He blinked, and it came through her skin. What's happening here? The vision of Lisa Anderson falling to the floor dispelled into mist. Evan turned. Principal Hockstetter was standing behind him, a look of horror on his face. Evan narrowed his eyes and hit the bastard with everything he had. At first, Hockstetter showed no signs of dying. Then his stomach split open and his intestines flew out, long, pink, and ropey. He screeched, then dropped. Come to me, Eugene said. I don't want to be alone anymore. Stepping over the principal, who twitched like a squashed bug, Evan left the school, his fury shattering windows and setting off water sprinklers. Outside, he turned onto School Street and started for the cemetery. He met a car on Pine Place. In the blink of an eye, it exploded, the flames reaching high into the sky. When he reached the cemetery, he looked back over his shoulder at the town, and several of the roofs caught fire. Come. Come. At Eugene's grave, Evan stopped. Come inside. I'm so lonely. We can be together forever. Forever. Yes, that sounded good. Nothing would ever tear them apart again. Closing his eyes, Evan imagined himself in his brother's coffin. And suddenly, he was. Brother, Eugene hissed. And after that, it took Evan Kurtz a long time to die. Okay then, what on earth just happened? What did I read? Um, really a crazy story, thanks to Joseph Rubis, the author of that one. Done a few of those stories from you recently. All been really excellent, incredibly intriguing and well-written. Uh, enjoyed that one, as weird as it was, and hope you did too. Thoughts, feelings, anything else you want to say in the comment section below the video, and as ever, I'll do my best to join in the conversation. Well, that's Friday evening. I'll be back again very soon. Something on Sunday, not quite sure what yet, but hope you'll join me at the weekend. Till the next time, my dear friends, very, very sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me, and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.